I think uh, we should start. So, is, um, is everything okay? Okay, so we have lecture three of uh, Jorge. Okay, so today we will do two things. I'm going to uh, do an exercise which mo many of you may have already done, but it's nice to remember it. It concerns um, extensivity and uh, how do we use the saddle point uh, in, in practice, um, and how, how we use it in everyday life. And then we're going to do uh, what I think is a, an extremely beautiful exercise, which is uh, we have a particle in a potential, even one dimensional, it doesn't really change, and we connect it to a lot of other particles, which are going to be our thermal bath, and then we will solve them away, or as we say, integrate them away, and we will, in this way, recover the equations for um, the stochastic equation of motion, which will be the object of a lot of things we're going to do, and which is, uh, are the object of a lot of things that are happening, and that surely you're going to use. So, what we said is, we have a system, and then, and this is the part you always guess, um, at some point, suppose that the system is composed, for example, on a lattice, and, and suppose that it has short range interactions, meaning that there is no interaction across the system. If it has long range interactions, then you have to rethink the whole thing again. And, um, and, then, and then you say, okay, the energy, well, how does it scale with the system size? Well, if I break the system mentally into pieces, I expect that, roughly speaking, the energy is going to be, except for some, breaking into pieces means that I will cut this interaction. Uh, then it will be roughly proportional to the number of pieces, and then, well, I expect uh, uh, this to scale like the number of degrees of freedom times, I, remember I use lowercase for quantities per unit degree of freedom, okay? This is a quantity that has a nice thermodynamic limit, okay? Uh, this is the part that typically you always, depends, if you want to do mathematics, you go to the books that do this mathematically, you suffer for a few months, and then you come out with a rigorous thing. But uh, most of you will not do that and uh, just use your intuition, okay? Now, there is the partition function, as I, as I mentioned yesterday, which is the sum, this is the inverse temperature, um, and here we put the energy of every configuration and we sum overall. And then we ask ourselves, is this a good, self, uh, a, a good quantity that has to be added, but then we realize that because this energy is itself a sum of energies of the subsystems, roughly speaking, this, rather than being um, a sum, it's more like a product. So we expect this to be like a product. I'm, uh, I don't know, arbitrarily cutting the into M pieces, let's say. So we don't expect this to be a nice quantity because multiplying is, is not uh, a thing that is additive. If you want a very simple example of something that is not additive, think of uh, um, resistances in parallel. When you add more, uh, this doesn't add, um, and so on. Okay, so this suggests very strongly, though, that the log of Z, also called E to the G, or also called E to the, mi sorry, minus beta F, the notation for this changes a lot, and the name for this changes a lot, but the name for this, this and this are the same. You see there's only a temperature in the middle that for the moment is purely conventional. This is what we call free energy. 
And about this, what we can say, because of this thing here, is that this is going to really be something like G of the temperature or Okay, when I, sorry, so that these quantities have a nice limit. Okay, so what is additive is not the partition function, but it's logarithm, so we give it a name. We, it, we know it's going to be important, and you will see why it is important, and it's okay. Um, let me give you another example so that you get some intuition. Remember that I said that we were uh, yesterday, when we were talking about the evolution of a system, we were talking about the volume of, for example, an ink uh, stain or, or something like that. Uh, so, so the volume of something in phase space, is it an additive quantity or not? And then, so what you think is, imagine I have a dynamical system that has some degrees of freedom, And in the composed, this is, this is the, just the composition of these two systems, I have a certain volume. Now we're going to think, always cutting a bit arbitrarily the system, and imagining two independent systems, which because I am mentally confused, I confuse them into one, okay? So what is the volume? Well, if, if the, 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 the volume here is uh, this volume in here, cross uh, the volume in here, no? because they are separate degrees of freedom. So you see that the volume here scales as the product of the volume in these two spaces, if they are not. So already you realize that volumes in phase space are not a quantity that is going to be additive with a degrees of, number of degrees of freedom. It's logarithm will, because if the volume is multiplicative, the log of the volume is additive. So, for example, one question that many of you will face in life if you do complex systems is, what is the base, if I have a dynamics that takes me to points downhill, what is the size of the basin of attraction? It's a volume. And in terms of all my coordinates of the system, what is the, the size? How do I do a thermodynamic limit of that? This kind of argument tells you, don't ask for the volume of the basin of attraction. The basin of attraction is all the points that are led to this same minimum. Don't ask for the limit of the volume and the thermodynamic limit. You, what you should calculate is the log of the volume. This is the quantity that will scale with a number of degrees of freedom, and this is the quantity to which you have to point. Okay? We will see a particular case of that, which is when the volume is, the log of the volume is as a name, it's called the entropy, as we said yesterday, okay? But usually, you have to, um, unless you want to be mathematicians, you have to develop an intuition reasoning in this dirty way. You cut the system in two in a reasonable fashion, you check that you're not saying anything that is really immoral, uh, but they are really reasonably non-interacting, and you look at the quantities you're interested in and you decide whether they multiply or they add or none. Okay? Very good. So let me do one calculation. Yes? Yes. Oh. You, uh, he didn't see it, huh? <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. You it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I took the logarithm away. Matteo's not paying attention. Okay. Um, mm, ah. Okay. Um, we will do one calculation that will illustrate a bit these things, I would like to preserve this. I don't know how I'm going to do. Okay. Calculation. 
If you don't follow in the more complete details, and here, from now onwards, there are going to be things that uh, some of you may find technically a bit. You can, of course, uh, if you have doubts, ask me later, but try to at least, um, if there are steps you don't understand, skip them in your mind and go to the conclusion and remember the conclusion at least of how the argument went. No? That is the way we read books. No? We don't follow line by line. We just uh, skip in diagonal. It's part of the experience of life. OK, so imagine I want to calculate the volume of phase space that has a given energy. So of all the coordinates, there is a volume that has a given energy. A way to put it, to put it uh, symbolically is to say that I'm going to write a delta function imposing this fact, and I'm going to integrate. Yeah, this is a Dirac delta function. OK, and now we're going to do a series of steps that will take us to another quantity. And these steps, you have to learn them because these are the, what you do every day if you do statistical mechanics. OK, so when you have something in statistical mechanics, you immediately have to put it in an exponent. This is rule number 101. Everything has to be written in an exponent. So we will do this. So remember from quantum mechanics or whatever, that you could write the delta function. Beta is now just a variable. I call it beta for other reasons that we will see. There should be an i here. And this would be a representation of the, of the delta function. Remember, it's a Fourier transform of the delta function. And you did it in quantum mechanics, for example. OK? But we don't put an i. We put a minus. This is arbitrary because it's, a, it's integrated over. Uh, we, in the books, never put an i here, which is i should. We just say that the contour of integration goes like this, which is the same as calling it with an i. Why don't we put an i? Because if not, it makes a, a notation more tedious. OK? Um, Furthermore, most papers wouldn't even tell you this. So they would say, well, we have an appropriate contour of integration. OK? <laughs> Very good. And now, let me try not to make too many mistakes. Well, I will follow tradition and not put it anymore. Um, just distributing. Oh, sorry. I forgot here. No, that came from above. And I am going to go to lower cases, sorry, because I expect that that this is a nice quantity. No, as we said before, the energy. So I'm going to uh, explicitly call it with a lower case in preparation for the fact that it's going to be a, a nice limit quantity. OK, now we look at this. And this looks very much like the partition function we said. Here comes the big step, is that we are going to say, I expect, and then of course one has to check, but I expect that this quantity here for the reasons there, and you will see the power of having, making this assumption, is going to be, I do it directly, I'm sorry, I'm going to use the G. It's the same, but it, it, it's, it makes life a little bit easier. This integral 
is going to scale with a size this way. No, because of the argument there. This is the only crucial step here. Whatever this integral is, it's going to be this. Notice that this is indeed a partition function for a given beta. The fact that beta, in fact, is imaginary because we are integrating here, for the moment, we, we just take with philosophy. And then here, this is e to the beta n e. And then we have to do this integral. Now I'm going to write it again so that we can discuss a bit. Good? And now, this is a function of beta. This is a function of beta. This is a constant. This is n, which is large. So we have, don't copy this because it's a repetition. OK? So now comes the technical thing that we saw yesterday. When I have an integral of something, it has a big number n outside. So this is going to, we are assuming, and this is our, our, our argument here, we, uh, we have that this thing goes like, so this function here, beta e minus um, g, is going to be something. And we are doing e to the minus n times this function. e to the minus n, and n is very large. This is going to be something like this. No? And so we expect this point to dominate in the integral. So this integral he, here, sorry, what am I saying? Yeah, this point will dominate because this has a minus, so you want the the minimal point, when it's large, this is minus an enormous number. And uh, so the, the, the actual integrand is a super peaked there, just like we said happened with the volumes in phase space. Again, concentration of the measure, OK? So mathematically speaking, so we can consider that this point dominates. Now, if you want a bit of more mathematics, what is going on is that you are integrating over some line from minus i in, in the beta complex plane from minus i infinity to plus i infinity. Remember that it came from a delta function. Um, somewhere here, there is a saddle point, which is going to be the minimum of this thing here. And it's going to be precisely on the imaginary axis. This is why I chose, or everybody chooses, to directly call this uh, uh, variable with a, with a, without the i. It's just notation, OK? And what is the idea? The idea is that, if you remember your complex analysis, your original thing was, had to be integrated along this line. And then you argue, OK, but if I go through the reals, and I do some contour that has a constant phase, then I deform my integral, and now it, can, it will be dominated by this, and in this way you argue your saddle point calculation. In practice, when in physics books you have saddle points, you do them without any complex. Uh, in the mathematics books, in practice, they don't do saddle points. Uh, although they come from analysis and all that, uh, this is one of the powers of how we theoretical physicists work and mathematicians. Usually, their problem is that it's hard to make rigorous a saddle point. We don't care about rigor. And so um, this, is, this, is, this is a difference, OK? So when you read a paper, this part, they don't even ask for excuses. They don't even put the I, et cetera, OK? So don't be worried about that. If you're going to do physics, if you're going to do maths or, or mathematical physics, it's a different story. OK, so after all this talking, we take the saddle point here. So it's, it's this function, so we have to differentiate with respect to beta and look for the saddle point. And this happens at
in a certain point, which I'm going to call beta star, which is the saddle point in beta. OK? I took the derivative of this one. So this already, how do I read this equation? This equation tells me that I can, this, instead of doing this integral, I basically will estimate this integral as the exponent, e to the exponent, evaluated in this particular value, which is read from this equation. G is this function, which you have to calculate somehow. But it's what? It's a partition function, morally. But not a partition function that I uh, propose directly, but it happened because of the representation of the delta. OK? Very good. And then from here, we have the dictionary of the beta, which is the saddle point, and energy, which is the same as saying that it's a dictionary between the temperature and the energy. Yeah? This saddle point equation gives us the relation between temperature and energy for this system. Of course, you have to know the G, but that's another story. The only thing we used about the G is how it scales with the size. Then, of course, if you want to solve this problem, you have to get somebody to compute this for you, which is tough, but it's another problem. It's a partition function. OK, so now you put it in. You put in the, the thing. And what you get from that is just evaluating this thing in the, in the saddle point put it there so it's e to the minus n and here to the plus n and here you put the value the, 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 the one that came from the blue equation e is given g of beta so I produce this dictionary put it here and I conclude that the volume I wanted to calculate it, I can approximate it to, to leading order, or if you want the log of the volume, to be more precise, I can compute it with that. And now, this thing, this is a function of beta, a function of the temperature, or of the energy, however, because energy and temperature have a dictionary. This thing is a, another function which I am going to call with small s, because it's per unit volume, per unit uh, number of degrees of freedom, the entropy. That is the entropy. And we will check in two ways that this is the usual notion of entropy. You, you will see it is. And it all came from the fact that uh, we did this, the crucial assumption is the extensivity of the log of the partition function. Extensivity means being proportional to the number of degrees of freedom. Uh, you, you choose, you have a dictionary here. Yes. Okay, so, uh, uh, yes, oh, B star of E. Yes, 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 yes. But, uh, OK. So you remember that I told you that G was also called beta times the free energy. But you also know, perhaps you remember that they told you that the energy is E minus T entropy in thermodynamics. So beta E minus beta E, beta times T is 1 times S, it's OK. This thing coincides with this thing. OK? So we have recovered the fact that this is the free energy that comes from thermodynamics.
And let us do one more verification. Oh, before doing the one more verification, sorry, you seem confused. Okay. Uh, before doing one more verification, tell me questions about this, what I did. Yes. Here we assume that there's no pole on the contour. Yes, you assume a lot of things. Okay. Uh, and let me tell you, uh, there is a complete divorce between the more mathematical literature and the physics one. You will never, in a paper of physics, 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 you, you will find this kind of calculation ad nauseum, but you will never find any discussion of non-analyticities or things like that. Uh, you just go on and uh, have faith in life. Uh, the actual mathematical literature would, of course, care about all that. Uh, but the mathematical literature, of my, my, my feeling, maybe Matteo has some idea on this, uh, it's so hopeless to discuss if there are poles or not that they don't almost use subtle points. But remember that saddle points are our silver bullet. Uh, we can solve lots of things that mathematicians cannot do because we use that. Yes, uh, but I was thinking about, I don't know if it's related, but if there is a like, phase transition in the system, would the partition function be, like, doesn't behave in no, the no. way that we can do this? You can get all the transitions um, in this way including uh, phase transitions, what happens is that a pole may, may, sorry, a saddle does something strange. It, it moves to another place or something. But um, in the, as late as, I think, uh, I don't know, when was the Onsagar solution? I don't know. At the beginning of the 20th century, people didn't know if this approach included uh, phase transitions. They, they, they were afraid that uh, the phase transitions made this approach invalid. And then, thanks to the Onsager solution of the easing model, which is something that sometimes people don't say, uh, the, it, you do it exactly without any of this, and, and, and you, you get the phase transition. So they said, OK, the partition functions are OK. I have a question because at first you said that beta was like just a parameter and then afterwards... An integration parameter. An integration parameter. But afterwards, aren't you treating it as the beta we already know, that it's yes, 1 over t? Yes, yes, I mean, when yes. did you make the, when when, did you make when the switch? When here, here, when you calculate the saddle point, then beta is no longer an integration value. It's telling you that the integral is dominated by that particular beta. That particular beta that has this connection with the energy has become a saddle point. Okay. Next, when you look at it, you say, oh, this looks like the inverse of a temperature. Well, actually, it's the contrary. The temperature, as we know it, comes from this calculation. Okay. Actually, it, the justification of so one thing called temperature is this calculation, in fact. So uh, once you see it there, you say, oh, I have discovered, theoretically, temperature. Right, thank you. OK, so let us make a small verification. Uh, where? OK, uh, I'm going to erase this. Just to check that I called entropy something that sometimes uh, we call entropy two. Uh, for those of you who have seen the Boltzmann formula for the probability of a configuration, Z is the partition function. This is the Boltzmann formula. So this is P of E of a certain EI, 
And uh, remember, uh, maybe you've seen it, it's even in the tomb of, Mon of Boltzmann. Well, some or integral, whatever. Okay. You have seen this formula. So now I plug this in here and I take the logarithm. So uh, this could be an integral or, or a, 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 a sum. So I, let me do, do an integral. of all the variables. And then I have to add the logarithm of this. The sign is positive because there was a minus here. So I take the log. And there is an integral of p, but this is a constant, so I take it out. And OK, this integral is just the integral of a probability, so it's one. And this integral here, it's a probability of a configuration times its energy, so this one is the average energy of your system. So, and here there's the log of z, but the log of z, we were saying that it was beta, by definition, its name was beta times the free energy, or if you want, the G function I introduced. And you see that this is the usual definition, as I did the calculation there, of the total entropy. I'm using capital letters because I'm not dividing by the volume. OK, so the Boltzmann definition of a probability and of entropy are perfectly compatible to, with everything we're saying. Okay, I should add that this thing of, remember the, 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 the logic we were following, this thing of having a delta function, writing it in the exponent with an integral representation of the delta integrated over the complex axis, taking a subtle point, having a subtle point equation that gives me the dictionary between two things, and then replacing, this is what we did, goes under the name of doing a, the whole procedure put together is a Legendre transform. What, what, the, what the, did it transform? You started with an energy and you ended with a temperature. That's a transform. You started with a microcanonical and you ended with a canonical. That's, that's what you transformed. Okay, just to repeat infinitely many times the things, I'm going to do another exercise, which is the same, but uh, I think I'm going to erase. Um, if I'm erasing while you're writing, tell me to stop. <clears throat> Sorry if I'm insisting a bit too much, but I think that these things, you, it's nice if you can really learn them. So imagine I have an experiment with independent trials, and the outcome of the experiment is this thing. I is the index of the time I do my experiment. Uh, let's say that it has a probability of happening which is the same for every trial. 
and it depends on a parameter, the humidity of the day. Okay? And um, I want to um, define um, the average. I'm repeating the experiment many times. I would like to understand how the distribution of this quantity, which is the average, this is the number of, uh, of trials, I'm doing. Okay? And I want to find the distribution. You know how to do this calculation, but now we are going to do it in the spirit of what we have been saying. You know how to do it otherwise, but let me do it like this. So I want to study the P of E. I put it a hat because it need not be the same as that one. So what do I do? Well, same philosophy as before. I integrate over all the possibilities of all the experiments. This is my space. I say with a delta function what things are. This is just saying this in a delta language. Then I say that all these are the same function that depends on the humidity. And this is it. <clears throat> now remember, statistical mechanics is the art of taking things to the exponent. So, um, no, I'm not even saying it. This time I spare you the I infinity. just wrote the representation of the delta, probably with a uh, wrong sign. Uh, indeed, probably the sign is, this is negative, this one has to be positive, so. Okay, so then this is plus, no, this is minus, okay? Yeah, I changed the sign, the delta function is even. <clears throat> okay, and now remember I said all the probability functions were the same, so I can write this as, remember this is an integral over the complex plane, but we never say it. I used small letters because it's an average quantity, and here I have Yes? This is just reshuffling the equation. Okay? But now look at this integral. Here. Well, here, no, because it's uh, here. Okay, now look at this integral. This is a function of beta. No, because once you integrate one of them. But you see that these integrals are all the same. Whatever the i, i is a dummy variable. Again, a trick you will find very often. This is an integral, dx i, or uh, this gives some function of beta, but it doesn't care what the i was. They are completely independent and it's the same integral. So this is all this term, including the product, this is this integral, which just to, to invent a notation, I'm going to call it z, which is the dx 
pi alpha of x e to the minus beta e, e n times. It's a product n times of this. Yeah? So, this is what now? This is integral d beta e to the n beta e, and uh, this z, 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 just to call it in some fancy way, it's going to be n times a, a function g of beta. Here it's, uh, uh, sorry, without the n, but the n appears because I have it n times. It's a product of n times the same thing. X disappeared because it was integrated. You see, uh, this is an integral. Thank you. Thank you. But you still... Okay. No, now it's okay. Now you do it. You do the integral. X dies. And you're left with something that depends on beta, which I decided to call it this way. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. And now, again, once again, we uh, want to... You see, this is a function that is all multiplied by n. It's a function of beta that is multiplied by n. As usual, when you have to, this has to be a, a reflex that you have, like, like the Pavlovian uh, dog, when you see something in the exponent. So two reflexes. First, whatever you have, put it in the exponent. Second reflex is, if it is in the exponent, it has a big number outside, do saddle point. I mean, this has to become second nature. And this is all physics. Uh, it's not only stat mech. You agree? And so now I do this with saddle point because there's this n outside, so I have to look for the minimum of this. And then what is the minimum? Well, again, I, di I differentiate with this with respect to beta, and I get E equals G prime of beta. This is the famous dictionary we were talking about. The G somebody had to calculate for me, and let me say that it depends on the humidity here. Very good, and now this means the, that we can estimate this as e to the n beta star, the saddle point, e minus g alpha, which somebody calculated for me, of beta star. This is also known as the law of large numbers. No, they, they, the experiment I'm talking could be throwing a coin n times and uh, making a zero of its head, a one of its tails, and tends to one half, and the, this is the concentration of the measure. But you see, and I, I did it on purpose to convince you that when we do Legendre transforms, we are doing exactly the same thing as when we do the central limit theorem in probability. It's always a saddle point calculation. This, uh, you can see that uh, it's very clearly the same idea as before, only that a little bit easier. Okay, and now one last uh, thing uh, so that you keep it in mind I hope next week I can get there. Uh, let's keep this in mind. I'm not going to do the calculation for this next thing, but just so that you think in these terms. In, okay, I'm going to erase. This is what I'm going to describe is something that is um, in a way fashionable. So imagine I have an experiment but now it's not this measuring n times a thing. The experiment is, is uh, made over time. 
So the, the one I was telling you that is, in, has been discussed a lot is I have uh, water, I have uh, something that stirs it, So uh, here, all sorts of nasty things happen inside the, the, the pot, of which I don't know much. And um, I'm doing a work per unit time, a work energy per unit time that I'm spending. Uh, I plot it versus time, and I see that It does something because the, well, the water is madly, you know, in, moving inside, so it's not quite constant. No, I mean sometimes a vortex comes and touches my thing, and then I get, a, and then etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so you want to describe this situation. Okay, and now we're going to think about that. I am not going to. Be, um, do the calculation. I just want you to uh, think and convince yourselves that it is more or less the same story. So imagine that there is a typical time when the system decorrelates. It forgets what it was before. It takes some time, no? It's, for example, the eddy time, the time for a turbulent thing to decay. So I could imagine mentally that if this is the time in which this happens, it's an estimate. My experiment, I, I would like to know the distribution of the total work I have done per unit time. So I do 0t And this is the W of T. So I want the distribution of that. Now the total work is, you see, more or less the sum of things that I can consider independent. Because this is the typical time. This I have to consult with a physicist that knows the problem. And they will tell me uh, this is a time where the, thing, the system forgets what it was before. So. This experiment reminds you of those independent experiments, except that a time divided by this characteristic time, T0, you can think of this as the number of experiments, something like that. So that when you are adding the total work, you're adding these results, which are more or less independent. And now you could do more or less the same calculation. Re look. This formula reminds you of this one. You're doing an average over time. And then you ask yourself, what am I going to get? What is the additive quantity? What is the multiplicative quantity? You can do roughly the same. And what you conclude is that the total work, the probability of it, just doing the same reasoning, is going to be E to the, it's not going to be, well, the n over there, so time divided by some characteristic time, which is the, the memory time of the system, and then a function that is, like our g before, intensive. What does intensive here mean? There is no thermodynamic limit. Intensive in the sense per unit time. So this is a g of total work divided by time, which usually I call this with small letters. You see that the analogy with respect to what we did before is total, except that now time is playing the role that before was played by space when we were doing the canonical, microcanonical. Yes? So, this is what you call a large deviation function or a Cramer function. I think. 
one of the two. Um, maybe it's the other one. I'm not sure. No, this one, I think. OK. You see the logic is exactly the same as before. The only thing is that additivity in space has been replaced by additivity in time, independence of different patches of your system has been replaced by forgetfulness in time. Of course, if things are very correlated in time, you cannot do this. But this means the following, that then uh, Mahesh does a, a measurement, and he repeats this experiment a thousand times, measures the W, and then because the average, and the longer the experiment, the more the average is going to be. As usual, you throw a coin many times, and the, aver uh, the, the distribution gets more peaked. So how is he going to plot it? Well, he won't plot W. He will plot log of W. But he will plot it divided by the time, because he wants, uh, sorry, it's divided by the time. It's this way. You divide it explicitly by the time. I, I'm, if not, I'm dividing it twice by the time. Okay? That's OK. But then, furthermore, because, and then he will get some distribution. Sorry, what am I? This is the logarithm of the, of the, of the probability, sorry, of this thing. And he's going to get something. And this is here. OK, now it's OK. But there is a problem. If he makes the experiment longer, the thing will peak more and more. So that is still not the nice way to plot things, because the longer the experiment, this is the same as you know, throwing a coin many times. Now, here, what it is suggested to you is that what he should plot is this thing here, but taking this factor into account. And then, if you divide by this factor, this log, then you're OK. So the log of p divided by t tau 0, this is the g of w over t, which is a universal function for large n. So what he has to do is take this log, now log of p, divided by the time with a certain constant, it doesn't matter, and then plot this against the work per unit time. And then this will tend to a universal function. I am just putting in words what this calculation here will tell you. So again, this, these are the large deviations. But the more times you do an experiment, you throw a coin many times, the more the data collapse. But this collapse is given by this factor outside. If you divide by that factor, then the curve is universal. Is this OK? Or? Universal means that once you have your experiment and you do larger and larger and larger times, this curve begins to reproduce itself. You see, universal in the sense that it now depends on per unit time and nothing else. A, a time has disappeared from all this part of the thing. It is here, and this, the factor here is what makes the curve become more and more sharp. Or let's put it this way. Once he finds this curve, put it in here, and already time will take care of the subtle point concentration, let's say. Okay? So this is the way to plot. And what I have done here is what is called uh, the large deviation principle. Why large deviation? Because you see, when time is larger, to get this value here, because of this t factor, it's becoming harder and harder. But that's no mystery. It's exactly like throwing a coin many times. If you want to have three quarters of heads, the more times you use, the more difficult it's going to be. 
So three quarters of heads is an enormously large deviation because in the limit of a million times, the probability that you get three quarters of heads is really, really very small. Okay, so, but the nice thing is that it has a universal function and I'm giving it to you today because I want to show you that the idea of extensivity in thermodynamics is exactly the same as the idea as large deviations, is exactly the same idea as the central limit theorem, uh, only that large deviations, for example, happen in time. But it's a, exactly the same idea of independent pieces, and then you repeat independent experiments, and then the measure collapses, and then you have to divide. Etc. Etc. And the technical method by which you do it, we did it before with this experiment, but if you do it with here, you will see it's the same idea exactly. Uh, just, you, ju you just have to say that one of these is one of these, and you're done. Okay? So, I'm telling you this because, unfortunately, the literature of this is the lit is the b belongs to the mathematicians for historical reasons. So, if you go to read the mathematical books that talk about that, you're going to struggle. But in fact, you are doing exactly the same thing that you learned in physics without so much pain, um, because historically this was not the territory of mathematicians, but it was the territory of, of physicists. Okay? Questions on this? Because I'm changing the subject. Okay, good. We're going to start a calculation, but I don't think we're going to finish it because I don't want to hurry up. Okay. This is a beautiful exercise that I think it was done, I'm not very sure who did it first. I don't know, one of these, um, which is the following. You want to study a particle which could be in any number of dimensions. We will call it uh, coordinate Q. And we want to study it in contact with a thermal bath, which is at temperature T. Uh, have you done it in the master in France, this exercise? Well, the source is the same. So <laughs> the mistakes are going to be the same. Okay, so you want to study it in contact with a bath. Uh, what does it mean, a bath? A bath doesn't mean anything special. It means that the coordinate Q and eventually its moment P, I am doing it with one dimension because it doesn't, you gain nothing from putting more. But the bath, yes, has to be very large. So here there are many degrees of freedom with coordinates. I'm sorry I've changed notation. I usually use x for both p and q, and now I've changed notation. But OK, uh, these are many, many that compose this bath. OK? And um, OK, and now what does it mean, a bath? Nothing special. It means that there is a, 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 an interaction between this and this, um, so that the total energy can be written as a system which depends on P and Q, in our case only one. Then there is a Hamiltonian of the bath, meaning something of all the PIs and XIs. Then there is an interaction term, which, 
which is um, an interaction term between the bath and the thing. So this is a, a, a function of, we, we, we will make it of Q and all the Xi's. And then there is another term we will have to add, which unfortunately we will have to add, which only depends on the system, and you will see why. Okay, uh, so, uh, and our trick has to be that we want to do the effect of this, but don't talk about it anymore. So the idea of a bar is simply that you have a big system, you have another system, and about these, you study their effect on this, but you, you don't want to talk about them. So a bath is just a lot of uh, degrees of freedom of which you're not talking. Okay, so um, we cannot do this for almost anything because we don't know how to solve almost anything. So uh, the, the only thing actually you know how to solve in this life is a harmonic oscillator, so we will make the bath made of harmonic oscillators. So this one, the bath is going to be made of simply harmonic oscillators. The mass, I'm going to put to one because it doesn't matter. Their frequencies indeed can change can, can be different according to, the, we will have a full distribution. So this is going to be just a lot of harmonic oscillators. Why did we choose harmonic oscillator? Because it's the only problem we know how to solve. The interaction is also easy. We're going to make it simple. These are constants that we have chosen. We are going to call m the number of these guys, which is going to, we are going to assume is extremely large. And this counter term comes from the fact, we are going to compute it just now, it's a, a bit of a nuisance. It comes from the fact that there is some energy in the interaction actually term that if we want to reproduce the original system alone, we have to take it away. And um, I will justify it in a moment, um, but uh, you will see what it is. Okay, so what is that the definition of the bath? For the moment, the only thing we are saying about the bath is here, the frequencies of the oscillators, and here, the strength of the interaction with my system. This is all for the moment we are saying about the bath. Okay, and I have to justify this counter term. So um, I want my problem to um, not uh, have um, this energy here which you can think of it as an energy of interaction. I want the system to interact, but I don't want to count this energy. I would like to be able to isolate the part of the energy that belonged to my original system. So what is this typical energy at a given temperature? I have to do the partition function H bar. So what's the reason for taking the counter term? I don't understand. Sorry? For taking, taking the counter term. Yes. I don't understand. OK, um, you will uh, let me do the calculation, and, I, and I'll, I'll try to uh, answer again, so OK? I, I was thinking, like, this kind of taking of counter terms are uh, when there is some divergence in the No, OK, OK, the name is, uh, no, yeah. forget about uh, field Those. theory. This okay. is just a name. Yes, it's true. The counter term name mm. comes from, is also used in renormalization. This yeah. is not it. This is, okay, compensatory term, okay? Okay. Okay, so now if I do uh, H of the bar 
let me compute the partition function, and uh, I put the interaction term. If I only had this, uh, what happens? I have this, and I have this. Okay, so this would be E, uh, let me do the partition function, integrating over all variables, E to the minus beta, and here it's PA squared over two plus omega A squared over two XA squared plus CA QXA. And you see, without even having the system, this gives me, this is a Gaussian integral, it's easy to integrate, and um, what you get is, um, the count, it's the following thing, is e to the So, uh, so this, you see, come, this gives you like an extra potential to your system, which you do not want, because you want to isolate in this part what was your true energy. So uh, this counter term is simply minus this, that will compensate for that thing. It's just a, a thing that part of the energy, you see, this is only os oscillators and my system, uh, and uh, this part of the energy wasn't in the original problem, so it's nice to consider it separately, so we put it here as a separate thing, and then so that what is left is the original energy here, okay? This is a nasty little thing, it's not conceptually important, it's just that we want to take away something that is artificially added by the bath, okay? Very good. But the counter term doesn't do much. It adds a uh, harmonic potential to your potential here. And nothing else. OK, so what do we do with this? And I think that I won't do the calculations today. But what do we do with this? So the beauty of this exercise is that now I can do not the statics, but the full dynamics of the problem in the following way. The harmonic oscillators have a dynamics that I completely know how to solve. Their coupling with my system doesn't make it less solvable because this Q, I don't know anything, this is my system, but it's still linear in the harmonic oscillator variables. So what I can do is I take my whole system, assume some motion for Q that we will have to this is our question, how does Q move? And when we assume a motion for Q, we can integrate, we can explicitly solve for the oscillators, take this solution of the oscillators, replug it in the system, and the oscillators will have gone of the problem, and you will have a Q, but a Q that is now dressed, its motion is altered by what were the oscillators which you, thanks to the fact that they are oscillators, you manage to completely solve them. Okay, so you will have a dynamics of Q and X, of Q, that depends on everything else, a dynamics of the X's that depends on everything else, meaning the X's, that depends on X of Q and Q also. This is the dynamic of the X's, this is the dynamic of Q, now, this one you can solve so that uh, the x's are gone and you get the dynamics of the x's as a function exclusively of q because you solve for the x's, replug because this is the dynamics of the x's here, and now you have a more complicated dynamics of the q's that have been, um, you know, the x's have been solved in terms of the q itself. So at the end, you get a monstrous dynamics of the cues. This is the exercise we shall do tomorrow. And the nice thing about it is that we haven't yet said anything about the bath. We only said these two things. 
But now comes the nice thing um, that will allow us to philosophize a little bit. Um, there was no randomness here in the problem. And now comes the nice thing is that we, we will say something about how the bath is energetically speaking. So we will say that the bath itself started in a state of nice state of energy in equilibrium. For the bath, this is innocent. And now we connect the system to it, and we, then we will have a dynamics that is truly in terms of a bath. And the nice thing of this exercise is two things. First is that it's first principles. You're not assuming anything. And the second thing is that there is nothing specifically classical in this exercise. You can do it quantum mechanically. It's just a little bit harder, but not much. You can do the same philosophy, because in quantum mechanics, also harmonic oscillators are solvable. <coughs> so that's uh, perfect. And this, OK, this is, this is an exercise that it's going to be important for us, because it will give us the equations of motion, the stochastic equations of motions that you will find everywhere around in your life. Sorry. Um, so here, essentially, you are computing uh, the partition function, the, the red part, the partition function. Yes, uh, yes. This is a, a sort of side remark. Which is, yes, but uh, this is appropriate if you think that uh, your system and your bot uh, are in a larger bot. Yeah, 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 right. absolutely, so, uh, absolutely. What, is, uh, absolutely. what you should do is probably to treat this thing uh, in the microcanonical ensemble, right? Uh, yes, yes, but in fact, it's only, if you want, an auxiliary step to justify adding this thing okay. so that at the end of the day, the energies you get are, are given only by V and not by mm -hmm. that aspect. But for the moment, take it as an arbitrary thing that I'm adding. Mm -hmm. This is just to hint at why we do it. Okay. Because the problem is that if we don't do it, then the system will behave as if it had that potential once it is in equilibrium. So mm -hmm. that's when you do quantum, the counterterm becomes more subtle because of what you say. Because then you cannot uh, say the same things. And it depends on time, and it has all sorts of nasty properties. OK. Yes. Yeah, so the counter term uh, uh, arises because we want to treat those X A and Q as a single harmonic oscillator potential. So there is the extra square term and that, that extra square term here should be managed by a minus. Yes, because I don't want it because I'm adding it. And I would like to see something that has only to do with V. So I put it explicitly with a minus sign so that uh, in the absence of, of V, I have nothing really. So, so it's a, it's it's a way of bookkeeping. OK, so it's the effective potential. Of the, yes, it's an effective piece of potential that comes from the oscillators, which is not interesting for me, so I explicitly take it away. But it doesn't change anything to, to anything important. It's, it's only to keep things in mind. Because if not, what would happen is that uh, even if I don't have a potential to start with, I end up with a potential that comes from the, the oscillators. And that's not what I want. I want the oscillators to, to equilibrate me, but not to change my potential. So I, I explicitly take it away. OK. And one thing, uh, this is OK. But uh, about the large deviation function calculation, uh, can you motivate us by giving some example like it was just... Uh, this is for the previous thing. Yeah, previous one. Yeah, I motivate you. Okay. The physical uh, problem, like... Any well, the, the one I gave something. you of, you know, stirring water yeah. exists. Uh, it's, it's an important thing. Um, there is a lot of... Um, an enormous amount of activity. In the example of the water is an example, but there are thousands, where you have a system and you stir the system in some way. Could be with an electric current, could be with an alternating field, any. And the system responds to you. On average, it sucks energy from you, always, because this is the second principle. But there are fluctuations, because the system also is a bit random or, or very complicated. no? And you want to 
understand the distribution of this. Okay. Or also, when you have a conducting system with two temperatures, so who was doing the quantum dots? Um, and the system is very small. So uh, the current, if T is larger than T prime, the, the current is usually going in that direction. No? But there are fluctuations, because this is a system that is hot. So in fact, the current fluctuates. And sometimes, even in rare occasions, because of what the electrons or whatever is do, are doing here, there can be fluctuations that even reverse your current for a very short time. And now you want to understand these fluctuations. And you're measuring over a big time. So how should I plot them? How should to make sense of them? OK. Uh, of course, I would want to do P of the total current that passed. But, well, it's clear that I want to do it per unit time on average, no? But is this OK? No, I need a logarithm because the fluctuations are in the exponent according to our calculation. But then I have a problem. So here is the current per unit time, total time. But then I have another problem that this, if I do a longer experiment, this average concentrates even more on the mean. I want to remove that effect to be able to plot a curve that for all times will, will work. So what we did says that we should divide this quantity by the time. And then you will get a curve like this with all your experimental points of experiments done over different times. So the scaling of the fluctuations of the electric current across this tiny little object um, have to be plotted this way. And the longer the experiment, the more concentrated on the, on, the, on the mean it will be, but just out of you know, central limit theorem. But this time is sort of compensating exactly that fact. And so you can do experiments of every length, and your points should tend to be on a universal curve that is called the large deviation function, which measures what? It measures the um, rare occasions in which the current was not close to its average, these uh, moments. And these are the large deviations. Now, there is an infinite literature on this. And um, because, and maybe we will get there, um, if you consider the rare moments where the current reverses, which is very improbable, there, are, there is a, a very nice uh, theorem, a relation between this and this that is are called the fluctuation relations, and these have been the object of 3,000 papers at least. Can you give some specific reference? Uh, we will later on. Yeah, um, that's, and uh, now, in practical life, the applications of large deviations that I know that are the nicest are on weather, because on weather, uh, it is a cyclone, for example. Of course, it's a large deviation. It's a rare thing that happens. But when it happens on you, you feel, uh, you feel it. And so um, these people want to understand these things. And so you have the equations of uh, turbulence in, in the atmosphere. And the large deviations are interesting for you. So there is a whole uh, line of research in this way. In the same way. The waves in the sea are, have a typical size given the wind and other things. But every now and then, there is a rogue wave, which is a wave that can have 10 meters or more. And nobody knows, I think, yet exactly what they are. But they are not necessarily produced by an earthquake. They are just some random fluctuations that happen to be very large. And again, they're rare, but if you are in the ship that is receiving it, uh, they're important for you. So um, there is a whole activity on large deviations that is, is very active, let's say. very. Uh, and then there's the fluctuation theorems, which, uh, study, which say something about these large deviations, which uh, 
can be a lot or not so much, depending on how optimistic you are, but they are one of the very few results we have out of equilibrium, so they have received enormous attention also. But you are pointing to things that are away from the mean, that are rare. Yeah. So, so and the... Uh, 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 when you divide the, that the log logarithm of the work by t, is it similar to, to, have, to have an unbiased estimate? Mm, I don't see the connection. Maybe there is. Uh, uh, I don't. I don't know how to what to say. Uh, uh, you say that if we don't divide by t, we are going to have a very small curve like this. And when we divide by t, we are mm -hmm. going to have what you draw in the ball. But because when you in statistics, when you have a, an estimate, and if you have maybe the mean that's equal to summation of xi. If you compute the expectation of that summation of xi, you are going to have n times the real mean. If okay. you don't divide by the n, you are not going to have the... Okay, yes, but here it's a bit more. Yes, but here it's a bit more because uh, it's not the mean. Here we are studying all the deviations. So it's uh, uh, the estimate of all your deviations from the mean. In fact, this is a thing that ha gives you a lot of more information that than that if you're doing large deviations. Hello. Coming back to the bath. So the way like the, the logic of this is that you want to somehow introduce a fluctuation into the system but excluding the effect of the interaction of the bath. Is that correct? Excluding a part of it, excluding how it changes the measure, but not excluding how it, in time, how it bothers you. This is just a, a static calculation, and we are taking away the effect it has uh, on, on this extra potential, let's say. But once we take it into account here, then the bath is not excluded at all. In time, in our calculation with time, this, there's no time here. In our calculation with time, the bath will be there and it will be doing things to you. Okay. So we are just uh, subtracting a thing that would bias a bit your... Why? Because part of your energy is stored here. And this is okay, this is physical, this is everything, but normally, you would like to study your original system and don't talk about this a lot. It's almost conventional to explicitly put the counter term and take it away because you, you don't want to say, okay, I have... But in, in physics, this part of the energy is perfectly correct. Uh, there's nothing wrong. It's a piece of information that is in the link between bath and system. A piece, a piece of, sorry, of, of distribution. Uh, you take it away just out of, because you, you don't want to give an equation where you specify something about the bath all the time. So in taking it away, um, it doesn't, you have the measure that you would have had with the system alone, the equilibrium measure. But the dynamics, uh, the bath will do a lot to you. So in a way similar to when we derive conventionally the canonical ensemble where we have the two part of the system somehow in equilibrium, but we don't care about the interaction. Yes, exactly. But we care and we don't care, because here uh, we don't care in the sense that we don't put it in the partition function in the energy, but we will show what it does to you over time. Thanks. Actually, just a moment on this. So, uh, <clears throat> so your heat button is going to infinity, I guess, no? So it's going you to have this idea that the heat bath is going to infinity. Yes. But uh, at the same time, uh, your interaction is negligibly small, uh, usually, yes. with respect to the bulk energy. So yes. how is this working here? So the, your CA are going to zero? No. What is what? going to uh, infinity is M, and that's all. Huh? M, M is, is going to okay. infinity, and that's all. We so don't make... the, here the interaction energy is much stronger than the... Self I mean uh, it, could be, it could be as strong as the, this one. That is not something that you can sometimes make the interaction with the bath negligible, but we don't do that. 
What we do is make the bath so large that it doesn't care about what you do to it okay. up to a certain point. Okay. So it's like when you have Brownian motion, you have one okay. particle of pollen in water. The glass of water is enormous with respect to your pollen, but uh, okay. that's... I didn't understand the, <coughs> the remark you made, Matteo, about the fact that we have to treat the red part in the microcanonical. Because if I think at the experiment we were telling about... If you think about an isolated system, here you're thinking about an isolated system with but and the system, right? And then uh, this is, uh, the, the energy is constant of the isolated system. So, so you should describe it in microcanonical. Yeah, so what, what Matteo is objecting, and he will object even more tomorrow, is that uh, I will say that my oscillator bath is in the canonical ensemble. Now you ask me, and how did it get to? Because I am trying to use this to convince you that you tend to the, to the canonical with, in contact with the bath. It's a kind of recursive uh, um, argument in the sense that I will assume it for the oscillators, and show you that this induces a, micro a, a dynamics that takes you to the microcanonical measure in your system. So you inherit the microcanonical property. In fact, it is true, and then we will go back to this maybe, that the, the being canonical is a thing that you inherit. I am canonical and big. I make you canonical after some time. And then you can act as a bath for something smaller, and you will make it canonical, and so on. Uh, where does this story start? It's a bit like the, the creation of the world. No, where, do you, where do you start it? Uh, there is a little uh, step where you should say, OK, there must be one system of which I can prove something. But here, for us, it will be enough, let's say. But yes, the canonical property is hereditary, let's say. And this is what we, we shall prove. He would prefer, because it would be more logical, to make system plus bath microcanonical and then prove everything, which could also be done. It's more work, but uh, yeah, that that would be, if you're a purist, a bit more fair. Okay. Okay. So I think uh, it's a good time to have a coffee or whatever you want, and uh, we will resume at eleven in the computer lab, which is on the other side of this hall, okay? Be sharp. Today I learned to rationalize the use. Uh.